this was an intentional result. The fact that you have a bias of any sort was an intentional result of very violent regimes that were put in place to dominate and to hoard wealth and to hoard power. And they needed to brainwash the globe in order to do that. And so knowing that can, again, help you separate it from who you are naturally. Because it can be hard to unlearn things if we think they're inherent to us, if we think they're natural to us. And so these types of biases are not natural to any of us, right? They are conditioned and they are intentionally conditioned. Hey YouTube, thank you for tuning in to watch the replay of my weekly Instagram live. I'm Dr. Sarah Webb, author, speaker, consultant, and coach who's known around the world as an expert on colorism. Check the description box below if you'd like to dive deeper. All the links are there. Now, if something you hear today resonates deep within your soul, or if you just like it or find it funny, make sure you hit the like button. It's like a virtual high five. And if you'd like to see more videos, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Much love. Welcome everyone to another weekly live stream with yours truly, Dr. Sarah L. Webb of Colorism Healing. So that tonight is a special night. <laughs> Thinking about the Tony 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 song. Um, because I'm going live on multiple platforms again. This is something I used to do back in the day. I used to go live on Instagram and Facebook simultaneously. Tonight I'm going live on Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram all at the same time. So fingers crossed y'all, it's been a while since I've tried to manage three, I've never tried to manage three different platforms at once, but it's been a while since I've tried to be live on more than one platform at the same time. So we'll see um, if anyone is watching from Facebook and LinkedIn, I will be sure to monitor, monitor that chat as well. But I do try to look at the camera and that's one reason why I might not continue to do this because my cameras have to be in two different places and it just makes it harder to make eye contact with the audience. But anyway, folks, you can see that I realized there's a title feature for the live so that I don't have to pin comments anymore. Tonight's topic is Unlearning Skin Tone Bias Part 1. And this is a carryover from last week's live stream where I talked about preference being conditioned and why that matters, why that detail is significant and what it does in terms of our agency. Um, so before we get started, I do have a few announcements. One announcement I'm super excited about. As I'm talking, be, feel free to say hello in the chat, drop your name um, in the comments, let me know where you're watching from, especially if this is your first time. But I have reconceived of my group coaching program as monthly support groups and I launched these new monthly support groups in March without a whole lot of fanfare. I kind of just like put it out there, but that has been going really well and I'm excited to welcome more people into the support groups over time. I do require all my potential clients, whether it be one-on-one -on -one or group coaching, meet with me first before signing up for any program. So if that's something that might be of interest to you, just contact me. I prefer email, sarah at colorismhealing.com. Um, I also want to promote the books again. I'm trying to get better at promoting all the things that I make and offer. But my two favorites right now that I'm raving about, the self-affirmation coloring book for kids and the colorism healing workbook for kids as well. So those are available on Amazon and other online retailers. And you can look at my profile for links there. All right, so let's see who's watching. Let's see who's tuning in. Hi, Consistently Cam. I like that name, Brooklyn, New York. We have Fiona Harvey. What's up, Fiona? <laughs> hey, from NYC. I know Fiona. Harvey, mainly from uh, TikToks. <laughs> Fiona makes good TikToks. Um, and a lot of uh, like self-care, affirmation type stuff. So folks in my community who like that kind of thing, from a black woman at that, check out Fiona Harvey. Let's see. Who else is in here? Welcome, folks. Welcome. So we'll get started on our topic of unlearning 
skin tone bias. Uh, trust and thrive. Hey, trust and thrive. I got a gang up in here. <laughs> um, let's see. There is from LA. Love the work you do. Oh, thank you. Yay. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. So the idea of unlearning skin tone bias can seem impossible. It can seem overwhelming, but I want to set the expectation that this is a process. It's probably a lifelong process for most people. And as I've mentioned several times before, colorism healing and our growth awareness and evolution definitely has to be a lifelong commitment. And it's something we have to treat like our daily hygiene, right? Just like we don't brush our teeth once a year. We don't shower once a month. Well, you know, some of us don't. I mean, I think there are people who do only shower once a month, but many people prefer to shower more than that. And so I think as we think about doing this work, doing this inner work, whether it be unlearning biases or healing or a combination of both, don't set the expectation that you're going to, a couple of weeks from now, you're going to be all good and never have to think about this stuff ever again. Um, I think that those kinds of expectations can really set people up for disappointment and can discourage people in the process. And so I'm putting that out there now just as a way to keep people encouraged and not have you burn out too quickly, right? Um, I'm pulling up my notes here. So the first thing, and I'm going to start, as I mentioned, this is a part one, so I'm going to start with the level of self-awareness. My first strategy, my first suggestion when it comes to unlearning skin tone bias is to start to notice your thoughts and your feelings and your behaviors. Become self-aware. Self-awareness is a fundamental foundational phase of unlearning skin tone bias and any other kind of bias or programming that we want to address. I actually mentioned this in a post earlier this week, or last week rather, that I am a firm believer in under, fully understanding a problem in the context of the problem as we try to find solutions to that problem. If you wanna know what direction to go next, it helps if you know where you currently are. And so I say that knowing that this can be really uncomfortable, right? If you start to become more self-aware and realize that you have harbored these kinds of biases, and maybe to a much greater degree than you would have guessed, that can be really uncomfortable. That can be really painful to become aware of yourself in that way. That's fine. And actually, if you realize that you've had colorist biases, discomfort is actually a healthy response to that recognition, to that level of awareness. It's actually a good sign that you feel discomfort in seeing this part of yourself or this aspect of your psyche. The other thing I'll add is to not blame yourself if you do become aware of these types of biases. Because there have been billions, trillions, gazillions of dollars over centuries spent to condition you and everyone else on the planet that dark-skinned dark-skinned people, people of African descent, etc., are inferior, and that people of European descent, especially those with lighter eye colors and lighter hair colors and stuff, are supposedly inherently superior. And so that was propagated, that was pushed onto people, imposed onto people through centuries of violence and brainwashing. And so one, it's okay if it feels uncomfortable. And two, if you start to recognize any of these patterns or you know, negative feelings within yourself, don't point the finger at you, right? You are not to blame for this social conditioning, this cultural conditioning. You are a product of your environment. And as I say that, we are not to blame for how we got here as a society 
but we are responsible for doing what we can as individuals to undo it and to unlearn it, right? And so there are some passive ways that you can start to practice self-awareness and there are some proactive ways you can start to practice self-awareness. And I see some comments coming through. I will pause momentarily to take questions or read comments. Um, hi, Paris. Welcome. <laughs> I see one person made it over to the stream uh, on either LinkedIn or Facebook. I'm not, I can't tell. LinkedIn. Awesome. So the first one is kind of a passive way to do it, which is to just wait and see what happens. Just set the intention when you get up in the morning, set the intention that you're going to start noticing your thoughts and your feelings and your behaviors in relationship to skin tone, whether that be your skin tone or other people's skin tone or hair textures, features. And I want to emphasize the importance of the feeling piece because a lot of times when we think about implicit bias, we think about people's thoughts. We think about what do I think about this person? But a lot of times implicit bias is so so deeply embedded in the subconscious that it doesn't even, it bypasses conscious thinking and it goes straight to a feeling. It goes straight to like a gut reaction that we have in certain situations or towards certain people. Claudia Rankin, who has a play out that I'm trying to see in uh, New York. I want to go see her, her new play. But Claudia Rankin, in the promotions for the play, she talks about what does your body do when it's standing next to my body, right? And so a lot of times biases, whether they're implicit or subconscious biases, they're not even things that we're thinking about someone. A lot of times it shows up just in the way we kind of pull back from somebody when they get close, right? A lot of times it's just in the the way our heart starts to race when we're in a certain setting or we're, we're in a certain group of people and we start to feel anxious, right? And so I want you to keep that in mind is that you're observing your thoughts and your beliefs and attitudes about people, but you also have to observe like your physiological reactions to different people do certain people um, instill this sort of visceral, instinctive fear when you're near them compared to other people? And a lot of you know black men talk about white women cl clutching their purses, right? And it's not that those women in that moment are thinking, oh, black man, dangerous, but they have this physical reaction, this physiological response to, to move away. And I, I, as a dark-skinned black woman, have had people do that to me as well, right? I remember I was at a sporting event. I was on a, the track team in high school, and one of my teammates' younger brothers was sitting next to me, or his mom told him to sit next to me. And I guess I must have, like, been sat down on the bleachers next to him, and he kind of, like, scooted away and, like, tried to get closer to his mom. And, like, that's, you know, those kinds of moments. And, you know, he was a kid, too, so there's no real way of knowing where that came from. Is it, like, just stranger danger? Or is it something about me specifically, right? You know where our minds go when that kind of thing happens. But that's, I think, something that we can learn to become aware of. But again, I say that this is kind of a passive approach because you're just gonna set the intention going forward that as you go about your day, as you interact with coworkers, as you shop for groceries, you know, drop off your laundry or whatever it is, just start to notice, well, A, yes, your thoughts, but also B, just physical sensations, feelings, emotions that come up when you interact with certain people versus when you interact with other people, especially if all of those people are strangers, right? Obviously, there are gonna be differences with your like spouse or your kid. You're not obviously not gonna interact with them the same way you do other people, but you know, all things being equal, what's your reaction like to those folks? And then as you start to notice those things, begin to ask yourself the question, hmm, I wonder what that was about. Okay, so the first step is to start to notice thoughts and feelings and behaviors. And then two, simply just out of curiosity, start saying to yourself, I wonder what that was about. Do I notice any patterns? Has this happened before? Have I reacted this way before? Um, what was it about that person that made me feel 
um, uncomfortable in that moment, right? So these are the kinds of things that as we start to become more self-aware and start to notice our thinking and feeling patterns, then we can ask that question and, and set the expectation to our subconscious mind that that's not an inherent or necessarily a natural response, that it could be conditioned. And so that's what you want to start waking up to waking up your subconscious mind because it's kind of like just been sleeping and now you're saying hey there are these patterns these well-worn well-tried pathways that we just take for granted like driving home from work and you kind of go into this trance and you don't even remember navigating your way home from work because you've done it so many times right like that's how our brains work and so you want to start doing things to wake up your subconscious to say, oh, wait, new information. Oh, wait, different scenario, right? I'm not just going with the flow anymore. I'm kind of like putting a wrench in the in the mechanisms that have been on autoplay for so long, for decades for most of us. Okay, this is a good place to pause and see what some of the comments are coming through. All right. So we have, it would definitely make you uncomfortable. Yeah, consistently, Cam. I like to say, don't focus on whose fault it is, focus on whose responsibility it is to do better. Yes, and it's everybody's responsibility. Um, it is important to both know the source of the conditioning as well as the path to unlearning. You need to know the history to actually make meaningful change. Yes, I'm getting to that part as well. Um, our trauma matters hello our trauma matters uh the thing that came to mind why does lighter skinned um ws get to hit oh yeah lighter skin will smith get to hit darker skin uh chris rock with little to zero repercussions just a thought yeah our trauma matters i definitely thought about the colorism angle in that scenario uh the light-skinned man slapping a dark-skinned black man in defense of a light-skinned woman, as I say, does not excite me, to say the least. Um, who else has something to say? Good question, I'd like to know as well. Uh, hey, Ancest MCP. I hope I'm saying your screen names right. Um, So Christopher C. Shirley on LinkedIn, hi, says, question for the end, do you have any advice on how to message the need for this internal work to folks who don't believe that anti-Black bias is a problem? Thank you so much for hosting this session. This is such important work. Thank you, Christopher. I'm glad you found your way over here because I don't think I'm streaming to the actual live LinkedIn live page that I scheduled it for, <laughs> but I will definitely bookmark that question and come back to it. So I wanna talk about some more proactive strategies for becoming self-aware and some more proactive strategies for recognizing where we have bad, bias patterns, either in our thinking or our, our behaving. Um, thank you, town girl, for the badge. So the first one uh, is we can take a survey, we can take stock of our past, right? So the first option is to just like become aware going forward. But another approach to start becoming self-aware and seeing where we might have biases and patterns is to do a survey of where we've been to do a survey of our past relationships, to, to do a survey of our past interactions and how did we um, treat coworkers in the past, our students in the past, our family members in the past of different skin tones. And not only does this require getting comfortable with discomfort, it also requires radical honesty. It requires a, a high level of courage to even step forward on this path because all of us might start to see areas where we do things that are not in alignment with our highest values or we have done things right because most people who are listening to this video <laughs> don't want to be biased and so the the pain of realizing that you have been it takes cur it takes courage to look at that it takes courage to go there for yourself and acknowledge that that is part of your past and, and possibly part of your present as well 
And so journaling, I am a fan of journaling. If you watch my content for any amount of time, you know I'm telling everybody to go get a journal or get a scrap of paper and write this down. So take stock of past interactions with family. You can start really, really young. You can start yesterday. But yesterday, when I went to the grocery store, why did I um, grab my purse when someone walked by, right? All the way back to childhood and why was so-and-so my favorite aunt, you know? And just take stock of those things. And just like with the present day mindfulness, as you're reviewing some of these memories, start to ask yourself, what was that about? Because it's I've heard so many people just be dismissive. Like, oh, well, I didn't mean anything by it. Oh, well, you know what I meant. You know, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, it's nothing. And so again, be willing to, to sit with it for a minute and say, why did I do that? What was that about? Okay. A second approach that you can take if you want to look at it more in terms of a just set amount of time or in a prescribed manner is to do quasi experiments on yourself, right? So you can watch TV. You can say, okay, you know what? I'm going to watch a couple of films. I'm going to look at all my favorite films and I'm going to see how many of those films um, have a light skinned leading actor versus a dark skinned leading actor. And how, how does that make me feel, right? Or I'm going to look at family photos and see um, if I attribute positive attributes to dark skinned and lighter skinned family members equally, or if I have more negative associations with the darker skinned family members. Or I can, or you can go into a public place, especially if you live in a diverse area or if there's a diverse location in, in that area, and people watch, right? So you can put yourself in a position to I start to observe, right, in this diverse place as people are coming and going, as people are approaching me, just walking by, minding their own business. Do I, again, have certain reactions, visceral or physiological reactions? And do I have certain thoughts or associations with those people? What kind of narratives might be on autopilot, on autoplay in the back of my mind when I'm in this movie theater and I see someone walk in? with their family or see someone walk in, you know, by themselves or with their friends. Or if I'm at a restaurant and there's a group of people who are speaking really loudly, do I react to them differently based on their skin, their skin tone, you know? And so we can actively do these things, test ourselves. We can test ourselves in ways. But again, that requires being honest because it's so easy to fool yourself. It's so easy if you know, like, okay, I'm going to look at different photos and, and see if I have negative narratives about dark skinned people. It can be so easy to like trick yourself into saying, oh no, when I saw that picture of the, the dark skinned actress, I just said, oh, she's my favorite actress and I love every movie she's in. I've had people do that in, in workshops and stuff when I've you know done similar quasi experiments and they're like, well, the, the first thing I think of when I think of black is, you know, magic and strong and things like that and I was like okay let's let's unpack that a little bit <laughs> um, and then the third thing I'll say super practical in terms of testing ourselves and becoming self-aware is to take an implicit association test so Harvard has for years put out for, for free people given people the ability to take a test assimilation on various aspects. So they have like a dozen tests that you can take, like for gender or for race or for age or for gender. And there's one on skin tone. So you can like take an actual um, measured quantitative test and they'll measure like your response time to people with different skin tones. And then they'll give you a graph at the end to say like where you fall in the chart. Like, are you in the 10th percentile of, of bias, color bias? Are you like in the 90th percentile of people with the color bias? Um, so that's a third very practical option. In the blog post attached to this video, I have a link to that implicit association test. So that's on colorismhealing.com. All right, so I'll pause again. My, I have one more strategy overall strategy that i'm going to share before i wrap up for this segment and then i'll be back next week with the more novel <laughs> tactics that we might use um okay 
See, this is why I'm, I'm hesitant about doing three different platforms live because the navigating between comments and stuff can get tricky. All right. We're doing the week. <laughs> the work. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, we're doing the week. Um, I'm trying to follow the work. Gotcha. With an E, by the way. Um, let's see. That makes it so much worse. This impact does not equal intention. Got to own your impacts. Very good. Um, as always, Dr. SLW coming through with the excellent actionable steps. Be honest, test yourself, take an implicit bias test. All right. <laughs> yes, our trauma matters for the, the laughing emojis. All right, so my the second overall strategy that I want to offer for, for this segment, and I, I, I envisioned it for a two-part segment. We'll see if I need a three. I don't know. But is to start to identify sources of negative and positive input. And so this is somewhat related, not exactly related to what an earlier comment was. I forgot who it was, but they mentioned you have to know the source of your bias as well if you want to adjust it. And so we know that the, the white violence that has been enacted on the, around the globe for centuries is the reason we are in this position of having to unlearn biases, anti-black biases, anti-indigenous, anti-women, anti, you know, so many things. <laughs> um, but I think in terms of taking action on an individual level and unlearning skin tone bias for yourself, one, that's important knowledge to have. As I was saying that this was an intentional result the fact that you have a bias of any sort was an intentional result of very violent regimes that were put in place to dominate and to hoard wealth and to hoard power. And they needed to brainwash the globe in order to do that. And so knowing that can, again, help you separate it from who you are naturally. Because it can be hard to unlearn things if we think they're inherent to us, if we think they're natural to us. And so these types of biases are not natural to any of us, right? They are conditioned and they are intentionally conditioned as a way for a very small number of people to continue to dominate and hoard wealth, resources, and power. But on a more micro scale, something that's within everyone's wheelhouse and with every within everyone's power of choice and how they move about their everyday life is to look for the sources of positive and negative input. So let's say yes, you have this gas. Let's think about a gas leak for example. You have gas, which is the white hegemony, the white violence, the white lies, right? Like the colonialism is another word for it. That's like a gas, okay? But then you have all of these pipes that allow the gas to get into your mind. The gas is coming into your mind through specific channels, okay? And so, yes, we have to try and get rid of the gas itself, but in the meantime, part of what enables us to do that is identifying the pipes, the pipelines that are allowing the gas to enter into our homes in the first place, that are to enter into our minds in the first place. And so some of those things include mass media, no surprises there, specific. Speaking of mass media, Hollywood, the Oscars, <laughs> white supremacist violence and delusion is that's one of its favorite channels. That's one of its favorite pipelines, right? Movies, television shows, school textbooks, history books, encyclopedias, museums, art museums, magazine ads, social media, technology, um, clothing stores, retail spaces. <laughs> Literally anything can be a pipeline, can be a channel 
to direct um, the toxic gas of white supremacist delusion and violence and letting it seep. And so once we identify what those pipelines are, I really hope y'all are following this analogy. <laughs> once we identify where those pipes are, we can then shut off the valve, right? So yes, the gas still exists, but I'm turning off the valve that allows it to get into my home, right? Like, yes, there's still toxic chemicals out in the world, but I can seal off or I can shut off the, shut off the gas, right? Or uh, let me move on to another analogy. <laughs> Yeah, I think y'all get what I'm saying. I have a very, very smart community on uh, Instagram and LinkedIn. I think y'all know the gist of where I'm get going. And so things like, in terms of you unlearning skin tone bias, the, any other strategy is not effective if you're constantly being fed anti-Black narratives. None of these strategies are going to really work if you keep exposing yourself to the amount of colorism and massage noir and anti-black racism and texturism that's out there. And so as you eliminate the sources, the input of those narratives, then the other strategies become more effective. And I think for me, if I can do use personal examples, because as I noted in some other forum, everything I offer up are things that I actively practice, either have practiced or continue to practice, is I do, I have done and continue to do media diets. And I don't mean a media fast where I just go off of social media altogether, but I do a media diet. So I'm not fasting from media, like I'm not getting rid of media, but I am dieting as in choosing very precisely which media I'm not going to watch. And so several years in a row I've done a media diet where if a dark-skinned black woman was not the lead character, if she was not the main central character, a dark-skinned black woman was not the main central character, I was not watching it. I was not watching a TV show, a movie, or whatever other media platform. I was only exclusively watching film, film and TV that had dark-skinned black women in the leading role, right? So that's what I mean by media diet. Now, for some people that might be a little extreme, and I don't do that all the time. Like, I am currently not on that diet. But there have been periods in my life where I've done that. I've done that for six months or for three months in order to um, create space in my mind to unlearn skin tone bias, right? But also as a dark-skinned black person that representation as a dark skinned black woman woman that representation was so necessary for my healing as well and so media is is the easy culprit it's the easy one to point the finger to another one that i often talk about is your friendship circle and this is harder than media because media you could just turn it off you could just unsus unsubscribe from hulu <laughs> unsubscribe from netflix i'm not watching those shows not going to watch those movies but when it comes to our personal relationships, those can also be sources and channels of anti-black narratives. Those can also be sources of stereotypes of, you know, and I think about the, the physics equation, what you get out, what you put in. I remember, I can't, I can't remember who taught me that first, but once I learned that, it changed my life. You get out what you put in. And so most of us, for most of our lives have been getting in stereotypes. We have the input, what we've been, what has been poured into us has been stereotypes, has been anti-black rhetoric, has been colorist rhetoric, has been white, white lies, right? And so one, again, we have to stop the input of that negative stuff and then look for input of the positive stuff. Start to accumulate and collect and curate input of the good, healthy stuff. And that is going to, those two things, simultaneously reducing and ultimately eliminating the negative input and increasing the positive input in terms of ne positive narratives about people with darker skin tones. 
that is going to expedite your ability to unlearn skin tone bias. Because you can be set, reciting affirmations, you can be doing all sorts of things, but if you're still getting fed that diet of, oh, dark skin is tough, dark skin is X, Y, Z, um, then it's gonna be hard to really make progress. It's gonna be hard to see progress. And it's like running with a parachute on your back, right? Or it's like swimming, swimming upstream, swimming against the tide. And so you have to both simultaneously eliminate the anti-black narratives and images and messaging and ramp up the pro-black narratives and images and those that affirm darker skin tones. Um, okay, let's look at some of the comments that have come through on Instagram. I can't remember where I left off. <laughs> Stop the harm at the source and then resolve the after effects. Okay, good. We're following. Good. <laughs> Shut off the pipeline. Yeah, okay, good. I was like, ooh, I hope my folks is with me. But I know y'all are have brilliant minds. Uh, yes, I do this too. Yeah, mm -hmm. for me with music I listen to, Town Girl 86, music, yes, because I love music. I just love music so much. Um, and I think that is another good one because it's a verbal narrative, but oftentimes there's a visual component to it too. And, you know, the, it could be the coloring books that we choose, right? Because you might think, oh, well, a how is a coloring book colorist when everyone's clear or blank? But I mean, I remember when I was younger, all the coloring books, the girls, like the Barbie girls all had straight hair. So even though I was coloring them dark brown, none of them had afros, right? None of them had round noses, right? And so, yeah, I can, I can color the coloring book black, but that doesn't mean there aren't other messages that are being present it even in those spaces um and also the so the people the relationships that we're in as well as the media and i want to include in the media or i think the the curriculum the cultural curriculum right things like school policies and dress codes and the way teachers teach textbooks and what's required reading and you know what movies are you watching in school or what is considered news what's not considered news right does do dark-skinned people who go missing get the same airtime as the lily white people or the biracial people who go missing and so for each of us it's going to be different and that's also why, like when I'm doing these like strategy sessions and like offering tactics, I just keep reiterating, like do the reflection for yourself because what I need to attend to, it might be completely different from what you need to attend to, right? As much as I love music, like music will be one of those things where I do not listen to colorist music. I don't care how good the beat is, how sick somebody's flow is, just, uh, uh, I, I heard that it was just one little phrase, one little phrase in a whole song. And you just ruin the song. We'll never listen to it again. I will unlike it, you know, block them or whatever. Um, for other people, it could be their Netflix obsessions, right? For other folks, it could be their, their social media feed. I love um, the fact that we live in the internet age because we do have the ability to unfollow people. And to go and search, literally search, dark skin influencers, um, dark skin bloggers, right? Like we have that capability now, and I think we should definitely be using that to again shift the ratio of anti-black narratives towards positive black narratives. All right. Oh, more comments. Lucid Lowe's, thank you for the badge. Um, I learn, unlearn, relearn, and repeat for life. Yes. Uh, I've been trying this with the musicians I listen to also. I haven't done it with film yet. Mm -hmm. Friendship circle, preach, sister, preach. Ooh, that friendship circle is a real one. 
I'm not gonna get into astrology, but if anybody is into astrology and wants to continue this conversation offline, we can do that. But yeah, the friendship circle is real. Um, the friends who make quote unquote jokes, or even if the your friends are your you know people you work closely with don't explicitly say colorist things or anti-black things even their behavior right and so that's why i kept repeating thoughts feelings and behaviors even the way they behave about themselves as dark-skinned people or light-skinned people or about or towards other people um even that is a form of input even that is a form of feedback right in terms of the messaging, sending a message to you and to themselves and to the people around them of who's valuable and who's not valuable, right? Um, I had a friend who was once a romantic partner say something colorist and I haven't spoken to them in almost two years and I'm okay with that. Aw, yeah, it's a tough, that's a tough one. That's why I said the, the media fast, the media diet <laughs> is the easy part, right? And so anyone who wants to start, I say start with the media stuff <laughs> and work your way up to setting those boundaries in your relationships, because it's, it's tougher. Um, but yeah, like people say to your point, um, Black in night 06, 26.2, people say we have to start treating colorist people the way we treat racist people, right? And so oftentimes if you find out that a friend or a partner is racist, you're willing to put up that boundary and end the relationship. But oftentimes we, we're more lenient when it comes to colorism and we tolerate it a lot more. And we should start not tolerating it the same way we don't tolerate racism from our friends. All right, so I'm about to wrap up here. Good hair, good body says, in grade school, teachers were bothered by the fact that I drew people as black with corals hair, coiled hair. They'd ask why I painted them black. I responded, I paint them black because I am. Come on, fam, <laughs> yes, right? And the, But again, the fact that teachers even questioned you was a form of input, it was a form of feedback. And so you can imagine other students who maybe didn't have um, like other resources that you might have had that made you proud to, to paint, you know, black characters and things like that. Other students of different races who have those kinds of teachers are internalizing their teachers anti-blackness, right? And so I don't know if for you it was like just your, the family you grew up in, the household you grew up in that made you want to represent yourself in that way. But not everybody has that. And so schools are very much... Um, breeding grounds are like training grounds for anti-blackness all right so i want to come back to i don't know if christopher is still watching on linkedin but you know you can watch the recording if you hopped off i want to go back to the question about how do you um message the need for this internal work to folks who don't believe that anti-black bias is a problem and I think that's not something I, I was able to reflect on going into this live. So my initial responses might not be complete, but I'll offer some of, some of what I'm thinking at the moment. And so a couple of strategies, a couple of tactics are to tap into the things that they do care about and then build a bridge to that and the thing that they think is trivial, right? And I'll also say too, what I, one thing I always say, one caveat I always give is that pick your battles. I learned this as a, someone who advocates about colorism is to pick your battles, learn to get very clear about when you're talking to someone who is choosing to be willfully ignorant and no matter how much logic you throw their way, will refuse to understand. So get clear about that. Because we're not gonna, you're not gonna last in the fight if you're throwing throwing all your energy towards people who are adamantly choosing not to listen and not to hear you. So I think that is one important part of that strategy. And then two, if you recognize that they are listening, if you recognize that they are at least open to hearing you out, then tap into something that they are do understand. Tap into that 
concept or that idea or that issue that they already have some passionate understanding about and then start to build an analogy or a bridge or a point of connection to anti-blackness specifically. Um, and then I think too, depending on the context or the situation is to draw from your own experience. And if it's someone that you have a close relationship with, a lot of times you can leverage your own ethos with that person. If it's a close friend or a colleague who claims to have a lot of respect for you, who claims to want to be in support of you, um, you can leverage your, your reputation and your connection to that person and sharing personal experience. And this reminds me of another live stream I did before because then there are some people who will respond to your personal story and then there are other people, and I think I made a joke about Aquarius people. <laughs> there are other people who like really like logic and Geminis are like that too sometimes. sometimes. There are people who really like research and statistics and sometimes just presenting them like a really interesting case study or data point can make them say, oh, okay, I didn't know that, I didn't realize that. But, but it's hard sometimes to encounter people who just need awareness and then they move forward from there versus the people who are just staunchly bigoted, right? And I think that's why sometimes these conversations are, are difficult. Um, there, there's more to that. I think that could be a live stream in and of itself, right? Is how to message this to people, how to convince people or try, you know, convincing people. It's debatable about whether we should do that or not, but just be bringing people on board, right? Like how do you have these conversations with people who might not be on the same page with you? I definitely think that could be a future live stream topic. So thank you, Christopher C. Shirley, PMP on LinkedIn <laughs> for another potential live topic. Um, but I think hopefully those initial ideas uh, can get you get the uh, the wheels turning in your own mind as well. Ooh, don't want to do that. Okay, so I do have an affirmation for you all. I do hope that you all start the the strat start implementing some of the processes and strategies. I know a lot of my followers, as you mentioned, already do this stuff, and I'm not surprised because again, I I like the fact that my pages attract people. <laughs> who are like with it and like who are really some of the more most progressive people in the world really whether you're and not just like the other like advocates like even people who in my community who have like 15 followers are like really about that life like y'all really about that life whether you are you know a public advocate or you're just um you know living your life but trying to live it to the best that you can um, I have mad respect for everyone that uh, has come across my path and doing this work over the years. So thank you all. Um, good hair, good body says, as an Afro-Latina, colorism is prevalent. So you get excellence at being direct and firing colorists without a pink slip. <laughs> They're always left bewildered. <laughs> I, I love that analogy. Firing colorists without a pink slip. <laughs> We're going to quote that. Um, to change a person's point of view, you first must change the heart and the head will follow. So that's advice coming from uh, Black Night 06 26.2, um, AKA Ray. Town Girl 86, can you do a live on colorist parents, especially mothers? Yes, and let me go ahead and write this down now. Okay. <laughs> so what I've done, um, Town Girl 86, is colorist mothers have come up in my lives plenty of times, but I've never done a live where that was the subject matter, right? And so it's, you know, I've done lives on like colorism in families, for example. And so obviously, you know, mothers play a role in that. But yeah, I definitely am open to looking more at the mother-child relationship specifically, uh, and then maybe following it up with a I actually, I actually did do a live on colorist fathers. <laughs> I did. I did a live on colorist fathers. And so I guess I should be a yin and yang and do a live on colorist mothers, right? <laughs> but yes, I like that suggestion. 
Um, thanks to the badge, Blair Imani. Good hair, good body. Says, I, I leave them with their thoughts. I have no desire to change their minds. They'll learn when it costs them heavily. Yeah, I think it's a tough negotiation, especially being a dark-skinned person. There's so much... Um, they're the cost. The cost of engaging with people is really high. You know what I mean? And so I've learned to be more particular about who I give my emotional and intellectual energy to, you know? And not everybody deserves it. Not everybody deserves your emotional and intellectual labor. That's real. Uh, my colorist grandparents learned the hard way. Oh no, you'll have to tell me more about that. Um, okay, I see Chris Carr says, love the wisdom, but sound like we always have to be the bigger person. Because if not, we are labeled as the bad guy, at least in my experience, and it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, Chris, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. That's Chris Carr on LinkedIn, y'all, saying we always have to be the bigger person. And I, I agree that that's a burden that we, ha we have. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, the family dynamic. You know, I... I can't just do like one live stream on colorism in the family or colorism in education. I'm always happy to like go into subsections of that. Like I said, I did colorist fathers. I don't, I can't remember what inspired me to do colorist fathers, but I think um, mothers and their role in perpetuating colorism within families is a good live stream topic in and of itself, as well as Chris's question. Um, that could be a live stream in and of itself is how to message the need for these things and especially in you know professional spaces and out in the larger community so good good ideas all around and i look forward to seeing y'all next week for part two of this where I, hopefully i because i haven't written the blog post yet so there ain't no telling what i come up with <laughs> but hopefully the tactics will be i'll i'll think of some like the novelty of it this week's strategies were like very baseline like very just foundational baseline. This is necessary for all of us if we hope to unlearn these things. And so what I will talk about next week are like activities. That's kind of how you could think of it. Like this week was kind of the, the, the overarching strategy. And the next week I'm gonna talk about like specific activities, different kinds of activities you can do. Um, so thank you all for your engagement, whether it be live or if you're watching the replay or the recording. Um, I just appreciate you tuning into this very important conversation and I'll see you all next week. Bye.